Senator Brendan Ryan, I don't know if any of you remember him, he was, he worked at the Simon community in Cork and then he became a senator and we had this argument about giving money to him and he said, look, you respect the dignity of the person by giving them money and not being judgmental about how they're going to use that money. You respect their dignity that way. But anyway, should you give money to homeless people or shouldn't you? I think there's something you can do that's more important than giving money and that is as you pass by, you can simply say hello. Now, what's that doing? Can you imagine sitting up there on O'Connell Bridge begging? There are thousands of people passing you by. And where are they all looking? They're all looking anywhere except at you. They're looking down at their feet, looking straight ahead, looking the other way, but they won't look at you. Why, I presume, it makes them uncomfortable. So you're sitting there, thousands of people passing you by, as if you did not exist. How does that make you feel? That makes you feel like a non-person. So if somebody just says, hello, freezing cold, what are they doing? They're acknowledging you as a person. And I said that to a group of women once, and a few months later, a woman came up to me in the street and said, I heard what you said, and I decided I'd do it. So I was walking along with my little three-year-old son. We saw a guy begging, and I gave my son two euro. And I said to him, now we're going to go up to that man up there to see him. And I want you to put that two euro into his cap in front of him. So up she went, said, hello, how are you? Freezing cold, how's it going? You know, a little bit of small talk. And then she said, look, my son has something he wants to give you. And the little fellow went up and he put the two euro into the cap. And the homeless man put his hand in his pocket and he took out a Mars bar. And he said, and I have something I want to give your son. Now, what was he responding to there? It wasn't the two euros, though he still made a profit, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the fact that he was treated as a human being. And that's the most important. Usually when I'm passing by, I usually say, look, I'm sorry, I don't have any change on me. And almost always the answer is, oh, that's okay, thanks. So I think just not ignoring them is the most important thing we can do. Affirming their dignity by just treating them as a fellow human being, by saying hello, freezing cold, how's it going? You know, I, I think that's uh, more important than the, the giving of the money. Um, I'll ask a question. Yeah, you're allowed to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly do you think? Is it like a biosocial, psychological model that we need to use to help these you know, damaged young people kind of come through their addictions. Like, what, what would exactly be involved in your mindset? Well, homeless people ultimately, the first thing and the most important thing is to provide them with safe, secure accommodation. The old housing policy was homeless people, or many of them, have problems. They may have an addiction problem, they may have a mental health problem, they may have a behaviour problem, they may have an anger problem, and so they're not really suitable for housing because they're not going to keep the accommodation. So let them go away, solve their personal problems, then come back and we'll house them. <coughs> that didn't work. It couldn't work. How do you solve your addiction problem if you're living in a hostel surrounded by active drug users? 
How do you solve your mental health problem if you're walking the streets all day with nowhere to go? So it didn't work and it couldn't work. So they adopted a new model. And the new model is called Housing First, or Housing with Supports. And that model is let's house homeless people and then provide them with the supports they need to deal with their addiction problem or their mental health problem or their anger management problem or whatever. And that works. It works in theory, obviously. If, somewhere, if somebody has somewhere to stay, secure and safe, then they're in a position to start dealing with their other issues. And it works in practice. It has worked in New York, in a particular project there. It has worked in Toronto. It has worked in parts of the UK. So it does work, both in theory and, of course, in practice. That was the, the, that's the model we now operate. And so they decided, right, in about 2008, I think it was, they adopted this new policy and they decided by the end of 2010, we will eliminate long-term homelessness and rough sleeping. And how were they going to do it? They were going to get 1,200 apartments in which to house the long-term homeless and rough sleepers and provide them then with the staff who will support them. So, and the policy was great. And in order to achieve, so they decided, we don't need hostels anymore. They started closing the hostels, some of the hostels, for homeless people. But where were they going to get the 1,200 apartments? Mostly from the private sector. And the private sector didn't play ball. So by the end of 2010, they had only got 300 apartments, from the private, mostly from the private sector. And so by early 2011, when long-term homelessness and rough sleeping was supposed to have been eliminated, we had ironically more homeless people than ever before, and more people sleeping rough than ever before. And if you remember, that was the bitterly cold winter. So a housing policy which does not have control of the inputs that are necessary to make that policy work, which in this case is accommodation units, a housing policy which can't, doesn't have control of the housing units that it needs is not a policy. It's a hope or it's a dream, but it's not a policy. And so the policy is terrific, as I said at the beginning, the implementation is a disaster. And the reason for that goes way back to the Celtic Tiger, way back to the uh, price of property, way back to the drop in social housing. You know, up to 1996 when the, when the, uh, when the Celtic Tiger began, one third of all housing, residential housing output was for social housing. During the Celtic Tiger years, when we had more money than we knew what to do with, the uh, social housing output dropped as low as 6% we just stopped providing social housing. And so the numbers of homeless people went up and up and up. In 1996, there were 2,500 homeless people in this country. In 2008, when the Celtic Tiger was just finishing, we had 5,000 homeless people in this country. In 1996, when the Celtic Tiger was just beginning, there were 25,000 households on the social housing waiting list. In 2008, when the Celtic Tiger was just finishing, there were 54,000 households on the social housing waiting list. The numbers had doubled because government failed to provide social housing. And the numbers now on the social housing waiting list, four years after the Celtic Tiger has finished, has risen to 100, officially 98,000 households on the social housing waiting list. So we stopped providing social housing. And government policy now is that it will not provide capital funding for social housing anymore, except to finish the Ballymun regeneration and to do a little bit more with the Limerick regeneration. There is no capital funding for social housing. All social housing in the future is going to be leased from the private sector. And that as a policy is a disaster. So I think we've got to try and we've got to uh, get back to providing social housing, accommodating homeless people and providing them then with the supports. That's the easy bit. The supports is the easy bit. Providing them with the supports that they need in order to uh, address 
whatever issues they have. In New York, where they tried this policy, and they took homeless people off the street, they weren't cherry picked or anything, they took homeless people, many of whom had been failed by homeless services, and they placed them in accommodation with support. And after 12 months, 95% of those homeless people still retained their accommodation. So it does work, both in theory and in practice. Yeah. Well, the very touched very upon is that non-judgment in these situations. I'm involved with the space and we often have kids from this very messy 14 to 25 age range who are all out there on the street. And they'll provoke quite easily because they already know what the reaction will be and they'll key into that quite early. And it's very difficult to then not have that reaction back at them. Um, I wanted to ask how on an institutional or on a personal basis you can have sort of protocols for dealing with that. Um, and I, I sort of have a second question which is I'm, I'm curious because of that sort of 14 to 25 split and how they all get sort of thrown in together, um, how you can see sort of like diversion programs which directly address that to, to get an advanced intervention for vulnerable, vulnerable at risk young kids. Right, institutional response. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw a film called Kess. You ever see that film? It's about a young, very difficult young fella that everybody had written off except one teacher befriended him and discovered that his real passion, he had a Kestrel hawk. And this was his real passion. And the teacher started working with him. It's a fantastic film about building a relationship of trust and, and with, with a young person who everybody else has, has written off because he combed in on what was important to that young person. So I think uh, in terms of institutional response, uh, for me the more difficult young person is almost by definition the more damaged young person and therefore needs the more help. But of course the more difficult young person is the person who's least likely to get that help. Uh, now I think schools have a special responsibility here, though I appreciate that they are underfunded and under-resourced and may not be able to deal with exceptionally difficult behaviour. But many of these kids feel a failure. They feel that they are different from everybody else uh, because of their behaviour, because of the way other people are treating them. They feel they are excluded from a mainstream group of society. Now you have to belong. Everybody has to have a sense of belonging. And if a kid feels they're excluded, nobody wants them in the community because their behaviour is too difficult, they're going to find a sense of belonging somewhere. And where are they going to find that sense of belonging? They're going to find it with other kids who are also being excluded. And so you end up with the gang culture in a community who's causing havoc to... Uh, so the key to... Uh, I think one of the keys to working with these young people is to keep them as long as possible in mainstream schooling. And I know that's very difficult for schools. But when kids are diverted off into special schools or into special need uh, groups, I know that has to happen because uh, for some children. But I think as, uh, the more we can keep them in mainstream school for as long as possible, then there is less of a sense of developing in them a sense of, of failure. So I think we really have to make that, excuse me, that effort uh, to resource schools properly uh, so that they can uh, maintain those young people uh, in those schools as, as long as possible. And communities have a role to play in this as communities. And of course, I can understand, a kid is very difficult. Nobody wants to know him. Everybody wants them to be well away from their house or from their street. Uh, but the more communities do that, the more we're driving them into an antisocial uh, belonging group uh, where they will create even more <coughs> So. Again, diversion programs can be very good, but again, we have to be very careful that in diversion programs, we're not making them feel different from other mainstream kids. The more they feel different, the more they're going to feel inferior. 
And the more they feel inferior, the angrier they're going to be with society who has made them feel inferior. So yes, diversion. I always say in areas like in, in poor areas, in poor neighborhoods, services should be open to everybody. They shouldn't be targeted at families that are at risk. They shouldn't be targeted at families where young people, their children are offending. All the services should be open to everybody so that that labeling of a young person as a difficult young person or as a problem or as somebody we really don't want to know, that labeling is less likely to take place. So the more I say we can integrate even those difficult young people into mainstream services and mainstream education, I think the better chance we have of them coming out at the other end. And of course working with families is just so important. You can't work with a child independently of working with the family. The child is part of the family. The family is such an important part in their life, even if the family is a very dysfunctional one. It's their family and it's very much part of their life. And so we got to work with the family as well as with the child. And of course the family is part of a community. And you can't work with the family without also working with the community. So it's a multi-tiered approach that we have to take. Here is a young kid who is proving very difficult. We have to work with that young person, but also with their family and also with the community. First of all, thanks for a very inspiring story. You've touched on a couple of times at the institution of the church and on the subject of the uh, so to allow you to go there, the, is there, um, I'm, I'm just struck by the, the Peter McVeary Trust rather than the Jesuits for Homeless Housing PLC or something like that. Did, did you find that you had to stand outside the institution to achieve some of what you've achieved or what, where was that about? Not that? really. Uh, I would say for, for a while I would have been sort of on the margins of the institution in the sense that what I was doing was very different to what most other Jesuits were doing uh, and was very different to what most other Jesuits expected me to be doing. So when I first went with three of us, well, three Jesuits, we went to, uh, to, to Summerhill. My father, Michael Sweetman, was one of them. Some of you might remember his name. He was a real uh, social justice campaigner as well. But when we went there first, there were the criticisms from other Jesuits. Ah, uh, you know, you don't want to do the hard work of teaching in the schools. <laughs> so you're off doing your own thing. But that disappeared relatively quickly. And I wouldn't feel now anyway. I would feel very supported both by the Jesuits and by the church. Uh, I think the attitude might be of many that uh, delighted you're doing what you're doing, glad it's not us. <laughs> And I can understand that. It's not everybody's uh, cup of tea to be working with uh, drug users and, and home difficult homeless people sometimes. Uh, but I would feel very uh, supported by the church. Yeah. But I would have questions about the church. I mean, one of the questions is, you know, when Jesus was around, everywhere he went, he was followed by thousands of people. Thousands of people listened to him. Sometimes they listened to him all day long. Forgot they were hungry. The disciples, remember the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000, the disciples had to go up to Jesus in the evening time and say, Jesus, for God's sake, would you ever shut up? <laughs> the people are hungry. Thousands of people, every town he went into, we're told, the whole town turned out to listen to him. What Jesus was saying was not irrelevant in his day. And yet the church's message is supposed to be the continuation of the message of Jesus. And yet today, certainly in our Western uh, world, that message is seen by so many people as irrelevant. What's happened? Has the message changed? And in some ways I think it has changed. And I think it has changed. And I would uh, just... In, in, in trying in one minute to describe how it may have changed. I think what we are now, pre Jesus came and said the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus' kingdom, Jesus' preaching was about the kingdom of God. And we have understood and what we preach, the kingdom of God is a place in another world in another time, heaven. And our job is to live a good life here so that we can get into the kingdom of God when we die. 
I think Jesus meant by the kingdom of God, a kingdom of God here on earth. A kingdom of God where people, Christians, live together by totally different values to the values of the society around them. They live together by values of solidarity, sharing what we have so that everybody's needs are met, of reaching out to those who are on the margins of society and welcoming them because they too are children of God. So I think what Jesus was preaching was, he came and he preached to people who were living in the kingdom of Herod. The kingdom of Herod was a brutal place. And there were people who were starving and people who were hungry and the rich didn't give a damn about them. And Jesus came proclaiming a new kingdom, the kingdom of God, which was going to be here on earth. And it was going to be a kingdom where everybody's needs were going to be met and everybody was going to be valued and uh, so I think that's where the message has changed. And I think the message has changed because believing in a kingdom of God here on earth is so threatening to our way of life. It is so subversive of our way of life that we are much more comfortable with preaching the kingdom of God in heaven. Yeah. Come to, we have 10 houses. 